First uh, Thessalonians chapter number 5, if you will. First Thessalonians chapter number 5. Just a little three-word verse, verse 17. In a series of instructions that Paul is giving to the assembly at, at, at Thessalonica, these are mature saints, even though they haven't been saints a long time. They, they've come to the place of, of uh, edification. And when Paul concludes the book, he gives them some instructions about how the local assembly is to operate. And he does it in, in quick, rapid succession. You notice verse 16, rejoice evermore. That's the shortest verse uh, in the Greek text of your Bible. The shortest verse in the English Bible is what? See, every kid knows that. And you remember it in the Delta. John 11, 35, Jesus wept. Uh, those, are the, those two short verses in your Bible both have to do with, with emotions and things that, that, that have to do with things that reach into, in, into your soul. Well, the next verse says, pray without ceasing. And you notice on down, he, the, the little short verses. Each of these verses is designed not to teach a whole realm of doctrine, but, but rather to bring a category of doctrine back into the minds of the believers, things that they already knew all about. And when he says, pray without ceasing, he says that not, not because that's all there is to say about it, but because he knew that they understood what prayer was about and that they were to be engaged in that in an unceasing, a constant manner. Something that was to be part of, their, of the warp and the woof of their Christian life was to be prayer. And their assembly life was to be praying. If you know anything about prayer, and I, I trust that you do, you know that it's one of the most asked about subjects in the Christian life. Uh, as I travel around the country preaching and teaching, as I answer mail from, from all over the country and, and, in fact, all around the world, one of the topics that we get often is, is, is the issue about prayer. You know, in, 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 instinctively, intuitively, a believer knows about prayer. And yet, in your experience, you know that you really don't know. You know there's that, there's that antinomy in that thing. You, I know, I know about it, and yet I don't know. I mean, all kind of questions. If God knows everything that we need, then why should we pray? You ever scratch your head on that one? You get that all the time. Um, can you change God's mind when you're praying? Or can, will, will, will your prayers change your circumstances in life? Is it enough just to pray once? Or do I need to pray for it over and over and over and over again? I mean, how many times is enough? And when did I do it enough? Uh, how can I be sure that God hears me, you know? What, what do I have to do? And how do I, how, how do I know for sure that God, God uh, um, hears what I say? And how does he answer me? I mean, do I get a voice? <laughs> how does he answer me? And more importantly, why does it seem like sometimes he doesn't answer me? And you know that issue of unanswered prayer is an issue that, 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 that lays on the table of the life of every believer. I've learned through the years that if you want to get response on the radio or on the television ministry, just talk about unanswered prayer or talk about unhealed bodies and people will start writing and, 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 and calling immediately. Because those issues of, 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 of why, why am I sick? Doesn't God really care for me? And if he did, would he let these things happen in my life? And why is it that when I pray, you know, we pray about our fears and about our anxieties and about our problems and about our wishes and our dreams and our desires. And we pray. We lay all those things before the Lord. And it seems so often that the heavens are brass and that God is silent. And that somehow we get this sense that, you know, nobody up there really cares about me. And I love, the, I love the testimonies people give about praying, you know, and they talk about, boy, this thing happened and that thing happened. And I got this book years ago written by a famous evangelist down south, and he, he said, prayer, asking and receiving. And it was just a, a book about that thick, full of how he would pray and how they did this, and his congregation prayed, and they just claimed the battle was heaven, and great, wonderful things happened. And I, used, I, I remember reading that book it just, as, it just as a young believer, only been saved four or five years, and I, and I, and I thought, well, that, that doesn't match the experience of the people I'm, I'm around, me or and the others. I wonder how many times he prayed and didn't get that kind of response. <laughs> he didn't put that in the book. And, you know, you see that. You, you only hear about the success stories most of the time when people are, are talking to you about uh, those kind of things. 
And prayer often can become a, a real confusing thing to you. It can become a burden. It can become almost a cruel mockery of the instructions, pray without ceasing. When we, when we go to God and we pray and we wonder, what is it that's supposed to be coming back to me from talking to God? And why doesn't he answer? Well, there is there, there's something you need to understand about the cause and the cure for unanswered prayer. The basic fallacy in prayer preaching, in prayer practice, is a failure to rightly divide the word of truth. Let me say that to you again. You need to listen very carefully about this. The basic fallacy in prayer preaching and prayer practice is a failure to understand the word of God rightly divided and to understand who you are and, and what God is doing today as opposed to who Israel was and what God was doing in Israel's program. The message that most churches preach and the message that most Christians therefore practice has nothing to do with the dispensation of the grace of God, but has to do with the kingdom program. And that hadn't come yet, folks. We aren't in the kingdom. And yet the, the message that most people are trying to, to, to preach about prayer and the things that most believers are trying to practice in their prayer life have to do with that kingdom program. You need to remember Romans 15 verse 8. Paul said, I, see, uh, I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. You need to remember that verse. If Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry was a minister of the circumcision, he dealt with men, it was, he, he lived in a time when God dealt with men on the basis of the distinction between the circumcision and the uncircumcision, Israel and the Gentiles. That means that his ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his earthly life, fit in time past. That means that the, that the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had to do with something different than where we are today because today God doesn't deal with that distinction. He was a minister of the circumcision. That's the reason in Matthew 4 verse 17 it says that when Jesus Christ came, he, he came preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and it identifies that as the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew 4 23. That's what John the Baptist before him had preached. He came in those days preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He came on the scene preaching the king is coming. And, and, and he, 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 he's about to take up the reins of, 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 his, uh, of his kingdom as he's been promising. And what you have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a Jewish Christ, a Jewish Messiah come to fulfill promises made to Abraham and to David. That's why the first verse in the book of Matthew introduces him as, as the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Because it's, it's on the great Abrahamic covenant and the great Davidic covenant that all the ministry you find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and even in the early Acts period, the first, at least the first seven chapters of Acts, is based. There's no gospel of the grace of God. There's no grace. There, there's no reconciliation of all men without any distinctions. But rather it's the message of the kingdom. With Christ as the king. And he comes giving the rules and the regulations of his kingdom. And the message of most churches today, and most of the, of the books you read about prayer, everything from E.M. Bounds' book on prayer, right on down to, to, to the most recent book on prayer, and, all, and the classics that are written about prayer, those books are written from the kingdom program view. And most churches and most preachers and most ministries today are, 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 are preaching the kingdom gospel, the kingdom commissions, the kingdom signs, the kingdom laws, the kingdom promises. Little wonder people are confused. Multitudes of people. Broken hearted. Little wonder that Christian people can't find the, the secret of, of the, the victorious Christian life. And they don't have the peace and the joy that the gospel offers. It's not hard to understand what that, where, that, where that comes from when you understand these issues. And nowhere does this show up more obviously than in the issue of prayer. I want you to listen with me. Just read a couple of passages. Go back with me to Matthew 21. Get you freed up here this morning. Give you something to do. Keep your hands out of your pockets. You have to blow on them a little bit. Matthew 21. Just... I'm not going to try to teach these passages. I just, I just want you to listen to the tenor 
of the kingdom prayer promises. Listen to the promises of the kingdom program about prayer. Matthew 21, verse number 21 and 22. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, If you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also you shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. It shall be done in all things. Whatsoever thou shalt ask in prayer, believing, you what? You shall receive. You see that sort of, an, sort of a, a blanket kind of a statement. Basically an unconditional statement. All they had to do was believe that, it was, that, that the capacity to accomplish it was there, and then whatever they ask will be accomplished. Come back to chapter 7. I ask you, have you ever tried that? And had it not work in your life? Well, see, when you try it and it doesn't work, what do you do? You have to develop theological gimmicks. You have to say, well, I just didn't have enough faith. You try, you try that passage in Matthew 17. He says, if you have the, a faith as a grain of mustard seed, that's a pretty puny little bitty piece of faith. It doesn't say you have to have faith big as a mountain. It said if you had faith as a mustard seed, just a little small speck of kernel of faith, you can move the mountain. If you had enough faith to move the God of heaven and earth out of heaven into your heart when you trusted Christ, I mean, you had enough faith to do that. You don't have enough faith to move a little mountain? See, we develop gimmicks to try to excuse because certainly we don't want to blame God of not doing what he says and being powerful enough and able to accomplish. It can't be God's fault. So we look at ourselves. That's natural. When you do that, can you understand why people would be miserable after a while? It wouldn't take long to say, well, I'm praying and I'm doing all I can and, and it didn't happen, so there must be something wrong with me. I'm not adequate. I'm not sufficient. God isn't going to bless me because of my faith. You know what that is? That's, that, that's a sure recipe for depression and misery and discouragement and bitterness in the Christian life. It's also the exact opposite of what grace is. Grace says that you're in Christ and you're completely and totally sufficient and more than conquerors in Him. Uh, you, you, you don't have... And all of a sudden you've got this conflict. Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh findeth and he that knocketh and to him that knocketh it should be opened. You know the ASK formula of prayer. Ask, A, ask, you gotta ask, and it should be given you. Ask, seek, and it should be fine. You should find K, knock, and it should be open to you. There it is. All you gotta do in prayer is ask. Do what verse 7 says. And what, what, what does it say will happen? You get it. John chapter 14. You ever try that passage in Matthew 7? Asking, doing the best you knew how to, to say, Lord, I'm believing exactly what the passage says. And I'm asking, I'm seeking, and I'm knocking. And I need to receive. And it didn't happen for you? Somebody says, well, we'll see the answer when we get to heaven. That isn't what that verse said, is it? Somebody says, well, he said no. He did answer. He just said, no, that isn't what that verse said he'd say. So we develop gimmicks to try to make, make, the, make out like the verse is okay and the problem's with us or our perception and that isn't what the verse said. You know what you do? You become a, a functional modernist. You become a functional literalist. I'm sorry, liberal, <laughs> not literalist. You become a functional spiritualist. Mr. O'Hare used to say people spiritualize the scripture because they don't have spiritual eyes. And therefore they tell spiritual lies. And that's what, that's, that's what we do with that. That's how people try to answer that. John 14, talking to the, to the 12 apostles. There are only 11 of them here. Judas is gone, but there will be 12 in Acts 1 again. John chapter 14 
Verse 12, verily I, verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I shall do, he shall do also, and greater works than these shall he do. But I go unto my Father, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father might be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. You know what it means to ask in Jesus' name? It means to ask on the authority and the power and the position of Christ. On the basis of who Christ is, I'm asking this. Now, there can't be any inadequacy in that, can there? You might say, well, I didn't have faith. Christ has faith. And I'm coming on the basis of who He is, not on the basis of who I am. And I'm coming and I'm asking in Jesus' name for this. Did you ever do that and didn't, didn't, didn't get it? You needed a job? We've got people in the assembly right here who need a job. You go down to the job, fill out the application, and say, Lord, in Jesus' name, for your glory only, I pray you'd get me this job. And they didn't call you back? And you say, well, the devil hindered. Don't you remember when Daniel and Daniel prayed? In 21 days, the devil stopped Gabriel from giving the answer. Listen, you're not answering. You're, you don't live in a day when, when you have to pray long distance or God has to send answers by Pony Express. You have God, the Holy Spirit, living inside of you. You don't have to pray across the universe. You just pray intimately with Him, bearing witness with your spirit internally. The, the instant you think it, it's done. It's prayed. It's, he, he, he received it. You're not back in Daniel 10. And so it says, well, the devil hindered it. Let me ask you something. What do you think? The, the devil could withstand you in a half a heartbeat. But what's he going to do with the name of Jesus Christ? How's he going to withstand the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, he can't. I've told you about going down here on Irving Park that day with, with, with one of the brothers to see the fellow who was, had the demon and wanted to get the demon cast out of him. And I wanted to see that happen. I was, thought that was quite interesting. I'd never seen this thing quite go on. I'd talked to Ernie Rockstead and been with him, seen him do it and all that stuff. And, and, but I'd never seen a grace believer do this. So I went down there with, with, with Jim. We, we went into the guy's house. And, and as, as, we began, as, as we talked to the guy, and he made, you know, he's a nice guy. Talked like, all right. But when we started praying, this guy just threw out on the floor and started thrashing about, kicking, and, and, and strange ooh, sounds coming out, words, uh, like sort of a, a little weird, you know. And, and, and the brothers that came, they were, down, they were down on their knees by him and had him holding him down, praying, Oh, God, in the name of Jesus, would you just... And I, and I listened to that thing for three or four minutes, and I said, Whoa, wait a minute, let's stop this. And they all looked up at me, and I said, Stop! This is nonsense. And they stopped praying, and the old guy, in a, few, in a couple minutes, he came to himself, got up, shook himself, said, What happened? <laughs> And I told those guys, I said, wait a minute. I didn't come here to see whether or not Jesus Christ could throw a demon out. I got no questions about that. I show you the verse in the Bible he does it. And I don't know what you're doing or what you think that guy's doing, but it isn't a demon that's in him that won't come out because there is no demon in hell, in hell or heaven that can withstand what the power of God when God exercises that power. The problem is you ain't exercising the power you're claiming or the demon will come out. Listen, you don't have to stand there and argue with the, with the devil about something when it's what God's doing. You find yourself arguing with the devil about something and him not giving, giving sway to the name of Christ, you must not have the power behind what you're saying that you think you do. And see, that's the problem in these passages. The problem isn't that there's something wrong with you. The problem with these passages when you pray and you don't get answers is that, is that you've got these promises and these passages in the wrong dispensation. God isn't dealing with us under the kingdom program. He isn't dealing with us under the kingdom teaching. We live in a new dispensation. He began a new dispensation. He set the old program aside and began a new program when he raised up a new apostle, the apostle Paul, and gave him a new message, the message of grace for a new group of people, the body of Christ. And he set the kingdom program aside when he set Israel aside. And when the fall of Israel came, and through the fall of Israel, salvation went to the Gentiles, God changed the program. And the reason those verses don't work, like the verses say, don't give me this business about, well, you've got sin in your life. 
Well, if, listen, folks. Jesus, Colossians 2.13 says that he has forgiven you all your trespasses. That verse says God doesn't hold any of your sins against you and doesn't deal with you on the basis of your sin. If you had to get rid of all your sin before you'd ever get, a, get, get God to answer a prayer for you or hear your prayer, you're in tough shape. You're never even going to smell an answer coming, much less see it or possess it. Not you. <laughs> And not me. But my friend, the blood of Jesus Christ is taking care of that. And, and Paul says, How shall he who spared not his own son, but freely delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? There's nothing that stands in the way of God giving you everything he has for you today. Your sins notwithstanding. Because Calvary has taken care of all of that, dealt with it, put it out of the way, and you stand before God on a different basis today. And you never prayed a prayer that didn't get answered because of your sin. And you say, well, what about Psalm 69? You know, if I ever got iniquity in my heart. What about Psalm Isaiah 59 where it says, the Lord is, you know, it's your sin. Listen. You go back in Israel's program under the law where they had to perform in order to get the blessing and, you under, and all those verses are immediately clear. They didn't stand on the basis of grace like we did. They lived under a performance system where if you performed, you got the blessing and if you didn't, you lost the blessing. And those things all fit in their program, but you're not in their program. You can't go back to the Old Testament Scripture, and you can't go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you can't go over in the first part of the book of Acts to find the teaching for you to live under in the dispensation of grace. And if you do, you're going to wind up in confusion because those passages and those programs don't work today. Somebody said to me, he said, but Brother Jordan, Paul was just a man. I'd rather listen to Jesus. Great. That's wonderful. Me too. And let me tell you something. Jesus Christ has said more since he left this planet than he did while he was here. There's been a, a later revelation from Christ. Paul says... If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God that's given to me to send to you, how that by revelation Christ made known to me the mystery. He's spoken again. And if you want to listen to Christ, then you're going to find the words of Christ that he gave to you and me. Not simply in a red letter Bible. But you'll find them in the epistles that he wrote through the Apostle Paul. And can I tell you that to understand the Word of God rightly divided will unlock prayer to you. 90% of Christendom and 99.5% of preachers don't know the difference between the kingdom program and the dispensation of grace. Don't really know the difference between God's purpose in Israel and God's purpose for the church, the body of Christ. So you just get a, a smorgasbord of a doctrinal potpourri that comes out and, and you just come along and pick out what you want as you go by the smorgasbord and just put on your tray all the little things that, that interest you and you wind up not knowing what in the world you're doing. Not knowing how to pray. So that most Christians when they pray, they're just wasting their time. Because they're not really praying. I believe with all my heart, that's the reason that when people come to see the Word of God rightly divided, one of the first things that falls apart is their prayer life. I've watched that thing for years. You show somebody about right division. You show somebody about the distinctiveness of what God's doing today as revealed through Paul about how, how great the grace program is different from the law program and the body of Christ is different from, from, from Israel and the, the mystery program is different from the prophetic program. You show people that. And one of the first things that goes in their life is their prayer life because they were wasting their time in their prayer life to start with, claiming stuff that isn't for them. 
beating their head against the wall till they're bloody and batty to no avail. Unfortunately, sometimes that's all people ever do is let their prayer life go to pieces. I don't want that for you, but I want you to understand that the cure, I'm, I'm sorry, the cause for unanswered prayer in your life is praying the wrong things. Praying on the basis of the wrong program. If you're back over there in Matthew 21 and Matthew 18 and John 14 and, and so forth, you're back over there in those kingdom promises, the reason they don't work is they have nothing to do with you. They're not what God's doing today. And you've got no more chance of getting those prayers to work in your life the way those verses read and that dude had to throw in some demon out of some guy down here in Irving Park that didn't have a demon to start with. It won't work. Too many people. Maybe I should say to most people. Prayer is, is a means of manipulating God. To get God to do what you want Him to do. You need the big brother in the sky... You need the genie up there in the heavens so that when you've got a problem that you can't handle, you've got a decision to make that you're not sure how to, how, how to, how to handle. The men around here will tell you, the, the, the elders will tell you that when there's decisions to be made in, in, our, in our assembly, and we sit and talk about them on the board, consistent, I'll always say, I don't care who makes the decision. You want to run something, I'll let you run it. I mean, I got so much to do, I'd be glad if somebody would take some of it. I don't care who makes the decision as long as they're responsible for the decision they make. Don't you go make a decision and then leave me to clean it up. Don't, don't, don't make a decision and, and, and then say, Oh, Brother Rick, it didn't work out here, you fix it. No, no, I, I, I'm not. if you're going to do that, I'm going to make the decision. Because if I'm going to make a mess, and I make them all, you know, I make one or two a day. <laughs> if I'm going to have to clean it up, I'm going to be the one responsible for it. But if you want to make a de decision, you know what I found? If you approach life that way, people don't want to make many decisions. You know, we don't want to be responsible for the decisions we make. We want to make them, tell everybody what to do, but let somebody else take care of the consequences if they're negative. And we'll take the positive consequences. People do that in prayer. You've got decisions to make. You've got things that need to be done. We want, we want to, well, here's one I don't want to make on my own. Better, better, get, better get some backup over here in case it doesn't work out. I can have somebody to fall back on. People want to use God to manipulate. To a lot of people, prayer is just a way to relieve guilt. Keep short accounts with God. Always, they're always confessing their sins to God and asking God to forgive them of their sins and I won't do it again. If, if you think prayer is designed, if prayer functions in your life as a means of relieving guilt for your failures, you have a basic misunderstanding of the cross work of Christ. It's, listen to me, it's Calvary's job to take care of the guilt and the penalty for your failures. In whom we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. If, if the weight of your failure and the weight of your sin bears on your shoulders today, listen, your praying isn't going to help at all. It hasn't helped so far. Because it doesn't get the work done. There's only one place to take your sin and that's the cross. If you're reaping the consequences of sin today, the only place to go to get rid of the guilt and get the issue settled is Calvary. And Paul says, as David described the blessedness of the man to whom God will impute righteousness without work, saying, blessed are they whose sins are covered, blessed are they whose sins are forgiven, to whom the blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. 
When God saved you and put you in Christ, he took care of your sin problem because that's what Calvary was about. And he didn't set up some big chalkboard up in heaven up there and watch and every time you make a mistake, write it down. And every time you pray and confess it, erase it. He didn't say, you know what he did? He took that whole chalkboard and just threw it away. Put it in the depths of the sea. Put it behind his back. Put it out of his mind. All those verses that talk about how in the depths of his forgetfulness, that's good enough for me, the songwriter said. You need to understand. That's where the answer for the guilt is. Is at Calvary. God dealt with your Savior there. That's not, that's not prayer's job. A lot of folks use prayer as a way to get financial and material gain. Come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. You look like you're freezing up out there. The most obnoxious practice of this, I guess, is the so-called name it and claim it idea. The, the power of positive confession. Now for people that don't know better, they think that's faith. But the, the power of positive confession, you know, Earl Nightingale teaches that and that kind of stuff. But the, that is a part of Eastern mysticism. That's all that is. It's got nothing to do with the Bible. It's got nothing to do with, I know, you know, I know the big shot preachers on the radio, on the TV, they all preach that stuff. But this issue of the power of positive confession, if you, if you can positively say it, you obligate God to give it to you. Is there anybody here today that wouldn't like to drive a better car than you drive? Is there anybody that would like to live in a little bit bigger house? Well, a little bit better, I mean, wouldn't you really like to have a big screen TV? Oh Lord, why don't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends, I'll drive Porsches. I must make amends. You know the song. You heard Brother Ted sing that. Sure, everybody would like to have more material things than you have. You'd like the things to go better in your life in other ways too, wouldn't you? See, it's not just that name it and claim it crowd. We do that. We want, we want circumstances to be different. We want things in our life to be more favorable to us on the job or, 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 in, or in our home or at school or, or in life. I always love the thing, you know, you've got two football teams. Got a, the, one of them's over here praying, Oh, God, help us win this game for the glory of God. This football team over here says, Oh, God, we want to win this game just for you, Jesus. I think God would get a little confused, wouldn't he? If he was thought any of that stuff had anything to do. You know, you want to win a football game, you know what you better do? You better have a superior strategy, a superior training program, and superior execution and performance on the field the day of the game. Praying isn't going to help you win the game. You're not going to get God to come down and say, well, you know, these boys over here, they just deserve it more. They've, they, you know, always for the underdog. And, and, and they've prayed. No. But that's what we do with it. And we use it as a means to get financial and material things from God. Like you some great vending machine up in the sky that if we put in our quarter of faith and pull the right knob, down the blessings come. And you do it. And I do it. Too often. 1 Timothy 6, verse, verse 6, he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. That word contentment, that is a rebuking word. Godliness with contentment is great gain. It doesn't say just godliness. It says godliness with contentment. Somebody said that contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want, but it's the realization of how much you already have. I mean, that's good enough I wrote down. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want. If I could just get that, I'd be happy. That verse didn't say anything about being happy. It said content. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want, but it's the realization, it's a mental attitude. 
It's a realization of how much you already have, and I would add, in Christ. And godliness with an awareness of who you are and what God has already done for you in Christ, everything that really counts, all of your need, completely supplied. According to the riches of His glory, Godliness with that kind of a mental attitude is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can take nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. What does God say is great gain? Not health and wealth. Because in the end you're going to lose both of those. All the so-called healing campaigns aside... The death rate still one apiece. There comes a day when it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work at the moment of the most extreme need, you're foolish to think it's going to work in the shallow waters if it can't take you through the deep waters. You're floating in the wrong boat. Common sense tells you that. Right division is the answer to, about why it's that way, but common sense tells you if the boat of men can't protect me and make me take me through the storm in the deep water I'm wasting my time paddling in the shallow water in it I need to get in another boat you're going to lose your wealth that's what verse 7 says you didn't bring anything in and you ain't taking nothing out somebody after a famous Millionaire died, said, how much did he leave? You know what the answer is. All of it. He left it all. Having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Let me ask you something. Is it possible to be content with what you have and be asking for more at the same time? Now you answer that for yourself. Sometimes people use prayer to gain God's favor and His blessing. Jesus says that, that don't pray like the heathen. They think for their, that they're going to be heard for their much speaking. People have the idea that if you use the right formula, the right words, at the right time, in the right manner, and with the right posture, that you're going to be accepted. God will look on you more favorably. You've heard people, especially preachers, say, please pray for me because the more people praying, the more God will work. Now you can go back over in Luke 18 and make a case for that, but I remind you, you're in Luke 18 in the kingdom program. You understand, people use prayer... When you don't know how to rightly divide the words, you're going to wind up praying the wrong things. You can go back in Israel's program, and, and there's a short account system where prayer helped to relieve guilt. That's not who we are today. You can go back in Israel's program, and there was, there was a system to give material and financial gain to them in response to their prayer life. Deuteronomy 28. That isn't where we are today. If you don't know how to rightly divide the words, you're going to wind up wondering, why is it that I pray and ask God to forgive my sins and yet the guilt doesn't go away? Why is it that I, I pray for material gain? Be like Pat Robertson. Brother McLean was telling us about, he got a letter from Pat Robertson and said, I need to, I, God told me that if you'll send me $100, he'll multiply it tenfold. We have to make it a thousand. And I need to re raise ten million dollars by such and such date. Terry wrote him a letter. He said, I got an answer to your problem, Patty. Send me a million dollars and God will give you ten. <laughs> Made sense, but he didn't hear back from Pat. <laughs> People use prayer to try to change God's mind. Or try to find God's mind. They want to get God's agreement with what they want to do. Well, buy this car, not buy this car. Sell this house, not sell this house. 
Lord, send me a sign. You know, is this car I want to buy? And if you want me to have this car, well, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to make an offer $500 less than what their, what their last offer was. And if you want me to have it, make him take my offer. So the guy takes your offer. Now God bought you the car. Three months later, the car is muffler systems out, the exhaust systems busted, the transmission slipping, and the engine's knocking. And you look at God and say, God, <laughs> what am I going to do? Hey, God bought you the car. Live with it. <laughs> Enjoy it. Must have been what he wanted you. You see, what we do is we, we try to project all that on God. Can I say to you, there are some decisions that God isn't going to make for you. God has given you His will and His words. You don't have to ask God what His will is. Hey, or here's a situation, what should I do? In God's word, He's revealed His will for you. And He's given you the privilege and the challenge and the responsibility to take that will, that identity that He's given you, and apply it to the details of life. And God doesn't really care if you drive a Ford or a Chevy or a Buick or a rice burner. Those are decisions that are your responsibility to make. Well, see, we like to use prayer to do those kind of things. And the result is that we don't really understand. When you don't know what prayer is about, folks, the reason, the cause for unanswered prayer is that you're, you're over here in the wrong program. Israel could go to God and say, Lord, what is your will? And they could cast lots. They had the unum and the thunum. They had direct revelation and intervention. You don't have any of that today. Why? Because his word is complete and everything he ever wants to tell you, he's already written it down, giving you a copy of it in your own language. You carry it around with you. And you're over here praying for God to give you his will when you've got it in a book sitting right there. That you don't crack. That you don't spend hours and weeks and years and a lifetime assimilating. You'd rather let somebody like me teach it to you. Well, I can help you. But you have to learn it. When you understand what prayer really is, though, it becomes a great asset to you. Just... I, Time's going to go, so I'm not spending. I'm just going to move on. Ephesians chapter three. But understand the the cause for unanswered prayer is that you don't know what you're doing when you're praying. You're in the wrong dispensation. You're in the wrong pew. You're in the wrong church building. In fact, you're in Israel's church. Moses had a church. Messiah has a church, and we're in the mystery church. And you're claiming things that don't apply to you, that don't, that don't deal with you. And when you do that, they don't work. Why? Because they don't have anything to do with you. Guy out there in Eastern Virginia is building an ark. I was on a television program a couple of years ago down in Florida. I'll be down there a couple of weeks on the same TV station. The interview program. And they had, they, I was, they were doing a whole week's worth of interviews in one day, and there I was, he interviewed, and this guy coming on after me, the next segment, he had his little, he's got this model of Noah's Ark. He's building a church in the hills of Virginia. The Ark. Because God told him to go do that. And I asked him, I said, how did God tell you that? He, he said, well, that verse back in Genesis 6 one day spoke to my heart. You know, you know. by the way, he hadn't got anything with the foundation, and he, he, he kind of got stymied, and they ran out of money. <laughs> but you know, that, that's, you know, you, know, you, you listen to that, you say, well, that's kind of silly. Kind of silly. Why would God want an ark? He, he's already promised he won't destroy the world with a flood again. You know, I could have understood a, a spiritual application of it or something, but not the, real, the literal thing. God, you don't build an ark today. The Bible told Noah to do it. Why don't you do it? Well, you know it didn't apply to you. Well, it's that same principle about prayer. Somebody says, well, you're just limiting God, Jordan. No, I'm not. I'm just going by what God says. 
God said he won't destroy the world again with a flood of water. I can tell you, God Almighty did it one time, won't do it again. And that isn't limiting God, that's just telling you what God said about what he's going to do. Can he destroy the world with a flood? Sure, he's done it already. Will he? No. Why? Because he said he won't. He's decided he's going to do something different next time. Be with fire next time, by the way. That's why you, you pray and you don't get answers. But when you understand what prayer is, then all of a sudden it becomes a tremendous divine operating asset in your life. Ephesians 3 verse 9. Paul said his desire is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now and the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. That's what we do when we preach this secret message given to Paul, this, this, this secret that was now revealed, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. We make manifest, the, we make known the manifold, multifaceted wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. All of a sudden you, we, we begin to take the plan and purpose of God and we make it known. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Now there's a great prayer promise. In Christ we have boldness. Not brashness, but boldness and access with confidence by the faith of Christ. There's no greater privilege in, in, in the universe than to be a child of God. And to be a part of His eternal purpose. Be a part of His plan to express His grace and love to a lost and dying world. Through the Word of God we know God. And we're able to make Him known. And part of all of that is that we have boldness and access with confidence right into the presence of that loving Heavenly Father whose love and grace we're making known. Probably the great, the great passage on prayer in Paul's epistles is, is Philippians 4. There, there are lots of, lots of instructions about prayer in Paul's epistles, but this is the one that probably you know the most about. Philippians 4 verse 6, Be careful for nothing. Don't be filled with anxiety and care and worry. Jesus said to Martha and Mary, He said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and cumbered about many things. Trying to serve God, trying to serve Jesus. Get the food on, get the gravy going, get the roast gun, get the, get the, get the, uh, uh, the cornbread out of the oven, get the beans on, get it all done. Here's the table set, here's the, here's the Dr. Pepper out. Everything ready. Care, just worried. Busy, busy, busy. And he said, Martha, Martha, you're careful and cumbered about many things, so full of anxiety and worry that you're getting it all just right. Mary has chosen that good thing. Mary is sitting at Christ's feet. He said she chose that one needful thing. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, and, and underline that word everything, in every detail of our life, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. You remember Daniel in Daniel 9? He said, I, I, I made my, I, I, with prayer and thanks, and, and uh, he's going to make his request known to God. And he said, I made my request, my prayer and supplication with sackcloth and ashes. That's what the law required. The law required you to pray with some performance and some formulas and some things attached. Paul said, when you pray, just do it with thanksgiving. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. That's what thanksgiving, that's grace motivation, an appreciation of who you are, contentment, if you will, not getting what you want, but is rejoicing and realizing in what you have. Let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, prayer is not a means of getting what you want, but it's a means of expressing and experiencing an intimate, personal relationship with a loving Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. And it's an opportunity to be a part of His plan 
to reveal His love, His grace, His wisdom to the world about you. Verse 6 is very clear. Prayer is simply talking to God about our cares and our concerns. It's communicating with God and enjoying a, a, a focused intimacy, a fellowship with Him. As we express to Him the matters of our heart, as we, as we talk to Him, we go over the details of our life and their conformity to His will and His Word. And we discuss matters of discernment where we, where, where we need the application uh, of truth to the details of our life. That's what we do when we pray. We just talk to God about our cares and our concerns and how our life... And the details of them, how can we take His Word and His will and His truth and see it worked out? And how does it apply? And verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, might possibly keep your hearts and minds. No, it doesn't. When you pray like verse 6, there's always an answer. When you pray, that's what real prayer is, verse 6. Not Matthew 21, not John 14, not Psalm 69. That isn't prayer today. That's disobedience. That's unbelief. That's spiritual larceny. But when you pray, there's always an answer. There's always that tranquilizing ministry of prayer that makes us always sufficient, always able to handle every situation we're facing and to be more than conquerors in it. That's the cure for unanswered prayer is to pray the way God would have you to pray today because there are always answers to that prayer. I've said to you many times you always know what to do. When you don't know what to do you know what to do. Go find out what to do. See you're never boxed in without a way out. He says, God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able. No trouble is going to come that's beyond your capacity to handle it. Why? Because bad things won't happen to you? No. Because of how sufficient He's made you to handle anything. No temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. But God will not bear, uh, allow you to be tempted above that which you're able but will with the temptation also provide a way to escape, listen, that you may be able to bear it. Not that it won't be there, but that it won't destroy you. You see, the sufficiency is who we are in Christ, not how He's going to manipulate circumstances on our behalf or someone else's behalf but how He's equipped us in no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation, His grace is, abounds toward us so that we having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. The bottom line to prayer is simply this. God loves you. You're His child. Talk to Him. Tell Him how you feel. Tell Him about your, about your gratitude for, for what He's done in your life. What God wants most from you is you. He wants you to grow, to know Him, to love Him, and to allow Him to live His life through you. My friend, the door into God's presence has been opened to you through the person of Jesus Christ, and the door's never shut. You're already inside the door, and when the door is shut, it just locks you in. Don't rob yourself of the opportunity to go boldly with confidence to the Father. In His presence you always have a hearing. And there's always an answer. Our God and Father, we thank You today for the peace of God that passes all understanding. That The wonderful tranquilizing effect that just being able to have intimate, personal fellowship with You because of the blood of Christ 
because of the truth of your word resident in our hearts that we can come into your presence even right now and just relax and know that no matter what goes on around us we're loved we're accepted that you love us that you accept us that you have already provided the best for us and that there we can find the peace that makes us more than conquerors in all things and we might be perplexed we might be distressed by things about us but when we're there we know that we're not cast down and we're not destroyed we thank you for such a wonderful asset that brings into our experience the reality of our identity in Christ and oh God may we rather than be burdened and plagued and confused by trying to claim promises that don't belong to us and work programs that have nothing to do with what you're doing today may we enjoy that wonderful peace that comes from just being who you've made us in Christ and seeing the wonder of that live through us as we walk by faith and the reality of your word to us thank you in Christ's name